Welcome to video 1.4, where we will introduce ourselves to the biological molecules most relevant to our coursework. Uh, along the way, we'll see some of the um, forces and interactions that are important in determining um, biomolecular structure, and we'll elaborate on those in subsequent lectures. First of all, of course, as we know, life is carbon-based. There it is on the periodic table. Some interesting things about using carbon as a as a basis for our for our uh, living molecules is that it has a valence of four. It can form up to four different bonds with different atoms, uh, which is very will ha turn out to be very handy. Uh, according to the Pauling Pauling scale, it has an electrotivity electronegativity of 2.5, suggesting that it can happily form bonds with either partially positive or partially negative partners, both polar molecules and nonpolar molecules. Uh, another interesting thing about carbon in terms of carbon dioxide, highly soluble in, wa in water, but not as CO2, only as carbonic acid. That, again, is a factoid that we'll want to keep in mind later in the semester. Expanding out from carbon, of course, hydrogen is very important. Well, mostly in the form of protons. We'll mostly refer to hydrogen as protons in this course. As well, though, we have nitrogen and oxygen, phosphorus and sulfur as being our key players in biological molecules. And once in a while, uh, we'll see as ions lithium, sodium, magnesium, iron, copper, zinc, chloride, etc. These are the most relevant atoms. Uh, elements, chemical elements that we'll see in living systems. Okay, now I'm afraid that the bonds are a little bit challenging in this to to identify. Hopefully, you'll be able to see them. These are the common functional groups that you'll that you will be expected to learn as we begin our study of biochemistry. We'll build on these as we go, but you're going to need to commit these to memory right away. And in reality, you should have learned them all by now. These should, again, you should, this should simply be a review of your organic chemistry functional groups. I'm not going to name them all for you. I'm going to, I suggest that you pause the video at this point and identify them all yourself. Write the notes right down on your paper, and we'll talk about this exact slide in class uh, in our next class meeting. Wednesday, what is that? September 1? I can't remember. In any case, this coming Wednesday we'll discuss these. Um... So pause the movie, pause the video right now. Okay, the ones that you probably or may have had difficulty identifying are this structure, guanidine. Of course, this is a phenyl ring down here, which you can barely see. And again, I apologize for that. Uh, a guanidine, stru guanidino structure here. We'll see this in the amino acid arginine and in other structures as well. And this is the functional group imidazole, which makes up the side chain of histidine. We'll see him later on as well. So I hope you, you have had no difficulty identifying all of those. Something that we want to pay close attention to when we're thinking about the chemistry of functional groups in proteins and other molecules is ionization. So let's walk through these quickly and think about how they ionize. Okay. This functional group has a pKa of 14. What does that mean? That means that, what does a pKa mean? Well, we're going to define that formally soon, but basically it's a, it's a reflection of how easily the thing ionizes, and in our case, easily meaning with respect to physiological pH. What's physiological pH? pH 7. For now, let's suffice it to say that at, with a pKa of 14, the hydroxyl does not ionize under, under physiological conditions. Sulfhydryl, pKa of approximately 8. We'll see this functional group in the amino acid cysteine, and it can lose or gain its proton. Uh, and that will be quite relevant for some of the chemistry that we'll be discussing in class. Primary amine, okay, protonated, can accept a third proton and become positively charged, pKa of around 10. Carboxylic acid, this hydroxyl group is ionizable. That is to say, at around pH 3 or 4, it begins to lose its proton and become deprotonated and charged. So this is the acid. The, the deprotonated state would be the conjugate base, 
Next here we have, the, in this functional group, the guanidino group that I mentioned, skipping over these others, which I'll expect you to be able to identify, uh, skipping over these others, this guanidino group, this, this amino uh, functional group has a pKa of around 12, so it will become positively charged, it's basic. Well, again, we'll be defining these terms more rigorously a little bit later on, but it can accept a proton and become positively charged around pH 12. So at pH 7, where proton concentration is much higher, it is always going to be protonated. Imidazole can also be basic, accepting a proton around pH 6, becoming positively charged in the process. This one in particular, again, the amino acid side chain, is going to be of, of very great interest to us because of the position of its pKa, right around physiological pH. You may wonder why I've used these tildes these, uh, to say approximately 14, around 10, about 3 or 4. The reason is that no matter what your textbook says about the exact pKa of these functional groups, the fact is that in the context of a protein, a structured protein, we see that these pKa's change. And they can change over the course of a chemical reaction as well. So they're not static and they're not constant. Um, so again, imidazole, because of the, it, the fact that its pKa is around 6, can expect, we can expect it to be pushed around at the physiological pH of 7. Ah, in this phosphoryl group, we see that there are multiple, right? This is a polyprotic acid, so there are multiple. Uh, hydroxyls that can lose their protons and become negatively charged, as we'll see as we move along. This one a pKa of around 2, this one as a pKa of around 7. Again, if you don't understand pKa's, stay tuned for the next slide. Ionization of functional groups is so important to understanding biochemical structure, biological structure, and to understanding the chemistry that takes place in living systems. Here are just a couple of examples and let's look closely at what the slide is telling us. Here's that carboxylic acid again. It can become ionized, and more properly, we should see a, an, an arrow indicating an equilibrium here. It can accept and lose a proton, and that's going to depend. The, the protonation state of the acid is going to depend on the pH, that is, the, the, uh, the relative abundance of, of uh, hydronium ion in solution. Before we look in detail at that, let's look to the right here. This is, looks like a titration curve. On the left side, we see the pH, right? Remember, pH is that's a logarithmic scale. And on the right side here, we see the hydroxide equivalents, or the amount of titrant that we add in, ter in relative terms. One meaning that we will have titrated all, the, all of the a uh, acid or base available, uh, regardless of what that concentration actually is. So here's, here's our first simple-minded definition of pKa. The pKa is the pH at which the acid concentration is equivalent to the conjugate base concentration. So what we're saying here is that we're halfway titrated, whether we're going, whether we're adding protons to the conjugate base or we're deprotonating the weak acid. Uh, pKa is the pH at which those two components are equivalent. And then as we go farther up in base concentrations, we see that we predominant the predominant form is the is the conjugate base. And as we go down in pH and up in hydronium ion concentration, of course, we protonate that acid and we have the, the, the weak acid form. Now, it is worth pointing out that this sh there's some aspects of this sh that should be fairly intuitive, right? Low pH means high hydronium ion concentration. So you can think of that as being the, 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 the abundance of hydronium ion concentration more or less forcing that weak acid to become or stay protonated. Low abundance of, of hydronium ion or H+, plus, meaning that that conjugate base form is going to be happy to give away its protons to solution and become ionized in this case. So this is what we can have, this is how we can interpret a titration curve and we'll say more about that later. Um, the, so the pKa here, the point that we're at equilibrium would be for your average uh, carboxylic acid around pH 3 or pH 4. And here again, too, I've shown you two titrations at once in this case, right? We're knowing that in reality we're going to lose protons over a wide range. Here we'll call this one pH 2 and, pH, and this one pH 7 approximately for their pKa's.
There are a few other ionizable groups. I mentioned them on the previous slide. Here's a hydroxyl with a pKa of, well, it's variable, but probably greater than 14, suggesting that actually un under most circumstances we're never going to populate that form, and certainly not under physiological circumstances. A pKa of about 8 for this sulfhydryl, again, meaning that at physiological pH, it's probably going to be pr mostly protonated, but we might be able to shove that around a little bit. And in this case, this primary amine not an acid, but a base, in terms of Bronsted-Lowry theory, accepts a proton at low pH below its pKa, right, and becomes positively charged. Let's say that again, and, uh, and forgive me if it's all too much repetition. The base, the primary amine, as pH goes down, hydronium ion concentration goes up, we add a proton, right? There's so much proton available, there's so much hydronium ion available that we force that proton onto the base, protonating it and making it positively charged. Okay, so moving on from those ionization of those functional groups, let's also look at lipids. Now we're entering uh, the, a few slides wherein we will discuss uh, the different sort of biological molecules that we'll ultimately work with in biochemistry, reminding you, however, that proteins and structural and functional changes of proteins are primarily what we'll be interested in. But first, let's look at lipids. A few different categories that we might see. Fatty acids. Here we see um, a polar head group and a nonpolar tail group. Typically, this is an energy storage medium. And in terms of structures, we, t we more frequently see a molecule like glycerophospholipids, where we have a glycerol. Here in blue is the glycerol backbone. And to each of the first two carbons, we have appended through an ester linkage. Uh, glycero uh, phos um, sorry, through an ester linkage, we've li linked a nonpolar uh, carbon chain. And then at the third position, we've added a phosphoryl group, which itself, in addition to being negatively charged at one position, can also accept another another functional group on the end. So we can highly modify the characteristics of the glycerophospholipid depending on what sort of functional groups we've tacked on to carbon-3. Another kind of lipid that, we, that you've probably heard of and that we will encounter are the sterols. Uh, this is a, a more or less rigid, more or less not perfectly planar because of course there's very little conjugation in these carbon-carbon bonds, but a fairly rigid, fairly planar, very hydrophobic structure. And again, we can affect the relative hydrophobicity of the molecule by change in what sort of functional groups, uh, polar functional groups, we tack on. Certainly there are other lipids that we will encounter, but these are, we can consider these are our main characters. Moving quickly on to carbohydrates. Um, there's a lot to say here, but basically we can begin with a monomer. This is a carbohydrate monomer. We see that it's a, it is more or less a hydrate of carbon for every carbon. In this case, we have a water molecule present in the form of a hydroxyl and a proton. Very polar, fa fairly polar molecules, but subject also to autocyclization, which is something that we won't worry about the details of now, but suffice it to say that at equilibrium in the cell, these linear carbohydrates are going to cyclize to form these um, cyclized carbohydrates. That's a monosaccharide, right? A theme that we'll be seeing here is going up from here. Let's go back to lipids, monomer to more or less of an oligomer. We're not quite a polymer, but we're adding, uh, we're decorating a sort of a backbone chain with other lipids. Here too, we can take a monosaccharide, link it through a through a glycosidic bond. This is a glycosidic bond into a disaccharide. This happens to be sucrose. We can also make polymers, so we can t oops, so we can take our monomers and put them into dimers and trimers, and we can build that into more or less uh, arbitrarily long polymers. This happens to be cellulose. Uh, I'll just mention here, since I, I told you that I'd refer to the forces that hold molecules together, uh, non-covalent forces, hydrogen bonding between this ring oxygen and this hydroxyl pr provides some of the rigidity or explains some of the rigidity that we see in a cellulose polymer. Let's turn to DNA, nucleic acid polymer with repeating phosphate sugar units. So we're really not seeing the nucleic acid here, but let's uh, we're, we're ignore for the moment the, the nucleic acid bases here. I've represented them with these R groups. Uh, instead, what we have is a ribose, or deoxyribose in this case. DNA, of course, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. There's the deoxyribose, a carbohydrate sugar molecule linked through a phospho diester. We can see that this is a diester. There's two ester linkages, 
uh, tying the phosphate to, from one ribose to another. And this is, this is the nature of a polymer. We have a repeating backbone, identical backbone units, where the unique structural and chemical information comes from in DNA, of course, is through the, through the bases. And let's take a look at those now. The nucleotide bases, as I said, defined the DNA sequences. We have two varieties of nucleotide base. We have the purines, adenine and guanine, and we have the pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine. ATGC. And here we can see uh, here we can see um, interstrand interactions. So in a DNA molecule, as we'll see, we have two strands of DNA non-covalently interacting with each other, and we'll talk at length about this later in the semester, but what we see is that the non-covalent interaction holding them together are hydrogen bonds, which we'll define much more rigorously in a later slide, but suffice it to say for now that this, hydro this nitrogen, this amino group, is donating a hydrogen to the hydrogen bond, which is being accepted by the lone pair electron of this oxygen. So, donor, acceptor, proton, lone pair. So these, now, these, in this GC pair, we see three hydrogen bonds forming across the strand. This is a highly specific interaction, and as opposed to the AT pair, where we see only two hydrogen bonds formed. And those of you that have done a little molecular biology um, might, might have designed oligonucleotides for, for example, uh, polymerase chain reactions. Uh, in that case, you're designing primers. You want to have Gs and Cs at the end of your oligonucleotides as opposed to As and Ts. Why? Simply because this is a stronger interaction. Gs and Cs will tack down the ends of your oligonucleotides a little bit more firmly than As and Ts will because they have one more, one extra hydrogen bond. All right. Let's think about some other structural features of the double helix. This is a molecule, a model of DNA. What we see is, a, is this is a so-called um, so solvent accessible surface. If you imagine in this rendering that we've taken a water molecule and are just rolling it, or imagining the water molecule is a sphere, we're just rolling it around the surface. You can see it's a little bit smoother surface than you might see in this sort of van der Waals map of, of the structure of the molecule, perhaps a little bit more um, accurate in terms of what a living, uh, what a water molecule would see. In any case, underneath that skin, I've drawn for you the atomic structure of the bases. And I've color-coded it according to charge. And this is, I might as well point out, that this is a sort of a standard representation for molecular surfaces. Carbon atoms are going to be colored usually gray or whitish. Oxygen atoms will be colored red. Nitrogen atoms will be colored blue. What do we see here? Well, we see that we have phosphates all along the external surface of the, of the backbone of the molecule. Highly charged, highly negatively charged molecule. Um, and... Um, we have hydrophobic interactions stacking the bases together, and then along the interior of that of that uh, interior axis of that molecule, of course, we have polar re uh, residues that are or polar atoms that are engaged in those hydrogen bonds. Now, and that's something else that we like to see here is that there's a major and minor groove. You see. Here, this is the minor groove, very little access there uh, into that channel, whereas in the major groove, it's much much wider opening. This will become important in terms of protein-DNA interactions as well. Imagine where a protein might be more easily able to interact with the DNA in the major group as opposed to the minor group. Not that both don't happen. Something that we will, I'm just going to refer to and not going to discuss it at, in, at length here is the fact that the major and minor groove is simply a matter of the structure that's adopted by the DNA. Actually, I will. I'll pause here and bring up a nice cartoon for you.